Good morning, and welcome to the 46th Annual pre du West Invitational Art Exhibition and Sale. Here to begin today's seminar is the President and CEO of the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum, Natalie Shirley. Good morning, good morning. I'm so glad you're here. I know it's early, but we have an amazing panel first up, so I'm, I'm just glad that, that you came in. Thank you for joining us for the opening weekend of Pre to West. This world-class art exhibition provides us the opportunity to bring together people who appreciate the American West through art. Today's seminars will fe feature artists eager to share their knowledge, their experiences, techniques, and trends in Western fine art. Because of the significance of the content contained in these seminars, we're pleased to once again extend the offering of these seminars to the public, reaching an even larger audience. This tradition continues because of the generosity of our sponsors recognized on the screen behind me. If you see anyone wearing a sponsor ribbon this weekend, please let them know how much we appreciate their support and contributions. We'd like to thank Panera Bread, our seminar sponsor, providing today's breakfast. We also thank seminar sponsors Steve and Wendy Olshan. Many people enjoy taking home a memento from opening weekend, and I'd like to mention that commemorative bolos and catalogs are available for purchase in the museum store located near the front entrance. The museum's educational programming continues to grow. We have several pre to west art moments scheduled from 1 to 2 p.m. each day where you can enjoy a variety of 10-minute spotlight talks throughout the galleries to introduce different works by contemporary artists associated with pre to west Our first spotlight talk today begins at 1 p.m. These educational talks will continue each day in the galleries, always between 1 and 2. It's now my pleasure to introduce our seminar MC and the curator of ethnology here at the museum. Eric Singleton focuses primarily in Native American history and his specialties include Native American Great Plains and Great Lakes beadwork, historic and contemporary weaving, and Mississippian period iconography. Eric is a decorated author and lecturer. His authority in Native American history has taken him across the U.S. We're privileged to have him lead today's seminars. Please welcome our seminar MC, Dr. Eric Singleton. Good morning. I have the pleasure of working around Western fine art each day. I truly enjoy working on each exhibit. Pre to West, however, is a special exhibition that we look forward to all year long. It provides a wonderful opportunity for conversation with our artists all over the course of this opening weekend by deepening our understanding of their works during these seminars today and tomorrow morning. Tonight, beginning at six o'clock, those society members and sponsors who purchase the premium package are invited to attend the exclusive preview awards dinner. Guests will have the opportunity to mingle with the artists while viewing the exhibition and then enjoying the awards presentation for outstanding works in several different categories. Tomorrow at noon, we'll present the Robert Lockheed Memorial Award and make the Pre to West Purchase Award announcement. And finally, tomorrow evening, the much anticipated art cell will take place with doors opening at five o'clock. Our celebration will continue with the live auction, music, food, and drink. We indeed have much to look forward to. The first of our seminars for this weekend is Finding My West, an artist panel discussion. And here to introduce the moderator for the panel is our own pre to west artist, Bill Anton. Good morning. It was about 15 years ago that I was privileged to meet our moderator for the first time. Uh, for this uh, panel discussion, uh, Randy Dutra. We had both studied with the great Ned Jacob and uh, that commonality ushered in what became happily for me an enduring friendship. 
In the intervening years, we've discussed, critiqued, encouraged, and inspired one another, and I assure you I've gotten the better end of this deal, the bigger benefit of our association. Randy's art pedigree is truly awesome. Mentored by both Clarence Delanius and Robert Lockheed while still a teenager, Randy learned animal depiction from the inside out, becoming a gifted sculptor and painter of wildlife, creating thoughtful and sensitive portrayals of large and small game in their naturally abstract settings. Randy took these same skills to New York and Hollywood, where he eventually in the forefront, was in the forefront of the groundbreaking GC animation, mostly notably in the 1990s blockbuster, Jurassic Park. The very, very best thing about Randy Dutra is his heart for learning and investigation. He's an inspiration to me and my college-aged children who frankly consider him something of a god. Uh, not for his accomplishments alone, but for how he freely lends his insights into all things bright and beautiful. So without further ado, please welcome artist, animator, author, lecturer, mentor, all around great guy and my dear friend, Mr. Randall Dutra. Well, uh, wow. Bill is as fine a friend as he is a fantastic artist, and that sets the bar very high. Thank you, Bill. Good morning. Uh, it's great to see you here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have, a, a, I think, an interesting seminar here. Maureen and I love coming to Oklahoma City because we're always welcomed with open arms and enthusiasm. We love meeting the new collectors, the supporters of the museum, the sponsors. We love the artwork that we see. The museum staff was heaven sent. Ed and Susan, uh, Melissa, uh, Natalie, Eric. I mean, we couldn't ask for a better home. One of the great joys that my wife Maureen and I have is getting into interesting conversations and discussions with our artist friends. And we have a real treat here today because we have three outstanding artists, all from different origins, who have all immigrated to the United States. I have been inspired by them. I am honored to be on the same stage with them. And I feel that it's a very uh, important aspect of America is its diversity. And the individuals that we have up here, these gentlemen, are absolutely uh, banners for that thought. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our first panelist. He hails from Gothenburg, Sweden, which is a uh, 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 western port, seaport. If it has hooves, claws, feathers, and fins, Kintelberg has probably immortalized that creature in bronze and stainless steel. I have followed Kint's work since I was a child. I have a clip file on him about this thick. And to this day, I keep looking to it for inspiration. Kent has been with this organization for 42 years and received a special pin yesterday from Ed Mio and Mr. Simon. And I just love this guy. He's got Swedish cool, he's got a wonderful intellect, and he's got a very quick wit. And I love him. Please welcome Kent Dover. Our next panelist um, has an amazing story. He, he hails from communist China under the reign of Mao. His immigration story reads like a, a novel. It could be a blockbuster movie. Although he has immigrated here, he has not forgotten his roots. He has made a wonderful series of the Chinese immigration experience. 
Uh, one of his latest paintings is here, in fact, in Frida West. Uh, and I encourage you to take a very hard and close look at it. It exemplifies what artists respect and what they aspire to. He has, in his work, reminded us of the many parts of, of the puzzle that make America. And uh, it is my great pleasure to get to know him. He's a very deep thinking man and loves this country like no other. Please give it up for Mian Situ. Yosemite National Park. This gentleman would go with his two brothers and his father and have his rifle at the ready. They would go to Kruger National Park. This gentleman hails from Johannesburg, South Africa. And in these camps, there would be, there would be lions, there would be elephants, there would be Cape Buffalo. And I love that image. It's almost Hemingway-esque. There's a romanticism to it. This gentleman is primarily known for his landscapes here, but he's also a wonderful wildlife painter. He credits his great success with his devout faith and the love of his wife, Celicia. Please welcome Francois Koch. something new here. Um, I'm going to have these participants answer questions in their native tongue. So, do you want to be Can you speak Swedish? Yes, of course. 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 Yes, of why don't we stick with English for now, okay? Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, beginnings are very important because it forms who we are. Our parents, our family is so integral to who we become and how we express ourselves. Um, so Kent, um, your father was uh, a plein air painter, a musician, and your mother was textiles and a little bit in sculpture? Yeah, she studied sculpture as a, as a young lady. And she was in art school when she got pregnant with me. In the summer, she was serving as a waitress in a fun fair, and my dad played there with his band. And I was the bloody accident. <laughs> <laughs> but, but a good one. <laughs> <laughs> but she had to drop out of art school. But, but many years, I didn't realize that she was a textile artist. And I, I lived in a weaving studio as a kid, and I'd be underneath the big weaver. And, and to stop it from scooching, she had old tennis shoes under the feet on the, on the, on the loom, and it was like sitting under the extension of my mom, you know. And then many years later, after she died, I realized that she had taken me to a sculpture closet as a baby, and she did a sculpture of my right hand, and I found it in her, in her studio. She died young from cancer. Do you still have that hand? I, I do, do indeed, yeah. yeah. And then I realized that I thought my art came from my dad, not to, but it was really my mom, you know, in, in many ways. Yeah, so I thank her posthumously. <laughs> <laughs> and Mian, um, I understand that um, under the communist regime, your parents would work in stores. Yes. Um, and that left you at home <coughs> with your two brothers, um, with your grandfather. Yeah. So your grandfather was very instrumental in shaping your values, and also, I remember you mentioned that he was cool on the outside, but warm on the inside. 
That's exactly right. Uh, I came from a family and nobody uh, is artist. And I'm the only one in the family to be artist. And my parents, my father, my mother, they work for the state. Uh, you know, the, in China, uh, this generation, you don't choose the job. Uh, the government assigned the job. So they were assigned uh, to be the store seller. Not salesmen, you know, if you think about salesmen, it's not, they just work in a store selling product for the government. Uh, so they don't have time. I barely see, see them uh, during the daytime. They uh, go to work uh, earlier and come home very late. So basically, my grandfather is the one taking care of uh, our children. Yes, you are right. Um, uh, he is very uh, kind of cool. And always discipline us, uh, and, but very warm inside. I still remember he was so skinny because you, there, you don't have enough food for the family. He always you know, saved the food for our children, so he himself very skinny, and I know, I know now he always feels hungry. So he would sacrifice his food yeah, for you. Yeah, he always, I didn't know, I didn't realize at the time I was too young. But now when, uh, by looking back, uh, that was the situation. And he himself uh, didn't have much education, but he emphasized the education so much on us. And when I uh, entered the college, and he feels so happy. Uh, yeah. Francois, um, your father had a furniture store. And your mother was busy raising three boys, so you had quite an active childhood. Yes, uh, my father was originally a farmer, grew up on a farm, so he had a background in the country. But uh, he started his first job. He actually worked in an art shop, mm -hmm. which is quite strange, actually, I think. But he ended up. Uh, eventually in buying uh, jobs through the years with a couple of uh, company um, uh, furniture trades. But he himself was an artist in a, in a way. I, you know, I still have some of his artwork. Um, I happen to have a horse's head which he did in watercolor when he was nine years old. And I promise you if I had to show it to you, you wouldn't believe that. But that, that, of course, is, I think, where most of our talent, because we are three brothers, and all of us ended up trying to make a living out of art. So uh, that, that is more or less my background. Uh, I studied at the art school, uh, after school, and um, did uh, commercial art, as I mentioned. But art was always part of our our background, and um, we were always encouraged, especially by my father, to uh, draw. I, I, I recall, you know, from very, very early at school, you know, that that was my thing. If I ever got into trouble, it was because I was drawing instead of listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, That's probably a commonality among yeah. all artists. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was uh, in different ways. It, you, you know, you, you live out what you've got. And uh, that was a God-given talent. And I have two brothers, and believe it or not, they, we all are in the art business. We all paint or that sort of So the costs are a triple threat. Yeah, it's, it's a, I would almost say it's like an illness. You know, it <laughs> runs through the family. And Ken, your first, some of your first drawings were of ships <coughs> as you were developing an artistic ability, square sailor ships. And you, Sweden has a very, very rich culture of art. Uh, Smyrna Lillefors, Andrew Zorn, Carl Larson, just giants in, in, the, in the international art field. So, so what was kind of your, as you were growing up, how did you kind of start focusing into animals and, and, and the rich heritage that you uh, come from? Well, I mean, mostly <coughs> I grew up in the Christendom, north of Gothenburg, on the Nile. And families lived there probably since Viking times. My grandpa had a trawler, and, and my great-grandfather was lost at sea in the in memorial stone through his ship and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so it was closeness to nature, you know, 
very difficult to make it. And, and endangered. And endangered, endangered of course. Yeah. But it was a barren island that it rocked, you know, and the sea was our source. And I thought watching the seabirds and closeness to nature, very romantic. And there were only primary schools on the island mm -hmm. and nothing else. And uh, m most men, including my classmates, when primary school was over, they got to sea on the shores. And in the summers, we worked on the boats. And you can imagine when you dump the car dams, which is the bag on the shores, on deck, you have to hear in deck in Sea Creek, because you scrape the bottom with everything. And I've been, I've been exploring, and Grandpa in the wheelhead, stop, stop. You had to sort out the edible fish, and the rest you dump. So I had it from the beginning, a close relationship to nature. And then when I was 12 years old, the book of Birds of Europe by Roger Tory Peterson came out in Sweden. And I bought it with the money I made from my lobster selling to selling to tourists. And and it made me dream out. I want to see birds in other parts of the world. And then my grandpa said, You're not gonna stay on this island, you're gonna go to the mainland for high school. And uh, and he was there of the fifth and June, so I didn't have much choice. So <laughs> and music was a part of your life too. It was very much so. I did when I went to the mainland. Yeah. You know, and all that studied violin. My dad wanted to play serious instruments. He played, he was an accordion yeah. and, uh, and his, the, the violinist in his orchestra was the uh, principal violinist in the Gothenburg Symphony Orchestra, so he wanted me to be serious. And I bloody hated the violin. <laughs> <laughs> Walking so across the schoolyard, <laughs> all my schoolmates, they made noises. <laughs> meow, meow. They're, They're gonna report, report me to the cruelty for animals, animals which I was carrying. <laughs> <laughs> hurting cat, hurting cat. <laughs> it was not cool. You didn't get any girls with violin. <laughs> Another side of the camp we haven't heard before. Uh, Ian, uh, you, because of, of your time a lot alone, um, you spent a lot of time um, being able to contemplate nature and being out in the country. Um, and a book that was instrumental in you understanding this bigger world of art. But one thing I gotta say here about Ian, he didn't even know he wanted to be an artist until he was 13. And for, for a man of his stature, for the art that he does, that's highly unusual to come to art at 13. And it was because uh, he had a friend who was doing portraits of Mao. And Mean started doing portraits of Mao and said, hey, this is, this is kind of neat. And this art thing anyway. And he came across a book of, of the Italian Renaissance. And can you tell us what effect that had on you? Uh, yes. Uh, well, when I was in elementary school, I was not interested uh, in art at all. Uh, I was forced by my brother to make some picture. Uh, he himself made a projector. So he needs some picture to project on the wall to show other children. Uh, so. I, I was not interested in that at all. But uh, until the Cultural Revolution uh, happened, mm -hmm. uh, that was in uh, 1966, when I was 13. So all of a sudden, we don't have any more school. Uh, all the classes closed. Uh, so uh, we are free. We were free uh, all the time. And yeah, I have all the time in my hands. So and one of my friends, uh, you know, at the time, all you can draw is Mao's poetry or his uh, enemies, uh, uh, <laughs> the caricature. <laughs> and so uh, I think he did a good job on Mao's poetry. So uh, I started doing the same thing. I thought that is the subject I'm going to do for a long time. And that was your, uh, that was your introduction to art, was doing those portraits. Yeah, yeah. that was the That's first step. Yeah, yeah, first step. And then by chance, I get the book from a library, and then I realized that what I'm doing is not uh, what they call art. So I start from the book and don't learn from those uh, Renaissance uh, masters, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael. And then I know oh, art is different. So from then on, I kind of depends on the book uh, I, you know, I uh, can reach. And you know, sometimes I even copy the whole book because it's, uh, you, you don't have the book selling in the store. So once I get a chance to have a book, I will copy the whole book. 
with picture with every wall uh, by myself and keep the keep the notebook for myself. Mm -hmm. Kind of wow. self self. Do you still have some of those? Uh, no, <laughs> I love <laughs> to see those. Yeah. And, and Francois, um, you basically described yourself. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's self taught. You had some artwork within your home that you copied, and you also had um, a little interaction with David Shepard. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about how, how you became a painter and what were your influences as a youngster? Yeah, well, I think, you know, it started, um, my father always encouraged us because we love drawing. I'm talking about all of our three brothers, you know, my elder brother, uh, which of course was uh, the first to start, um, he, he did a lot of uh, paintings and drawings when he was younger too, and he ended up, uh, you know, becoming a professional artist before I did. But um, as I say, we grew up in a family which uh, really loved drawing and so on, and uh, my father was a collector of art as well. He had some quite good paintings, but he always had, uh, because of his own ability, to uh, draw, he designed furniture and things like that in, in some time, you know, uh, in a freelance kind of way. He didn't do it full time, mm -hmm. but he was in the trade and uh, he used to design, like I think there was one case he did a, a, a in those days, that's what he called a wonder robe with a particular like kind of a, a wardrobe for maybe a bachelor or somebody with all kinds of gadgets in with him. In any case, just to give you an idea, he was always into the arts himself. So very, so very inventive in the way he came up with the designs for the furniture, yeah. for the space and everything else. Exactly. Yeah. But, um, you know, uh, as I say, from when I started very, very young, I can think probably around about seven, eight, because I still have a drawing somewhere of uh, a World War scene with an airplane bombing something. So, and that I was born in 1944, so I wasn't really <laughs> that young uh, at that stage. I don't know why that came up, but my father must have kept that, and I just have that. But we, um, you know, that was the kind of thing we kept ourselves busy. My, I'm talking the brothers. My younger brother, not so much, but my elder brother really took the lead and ended up, we followed more or less the same direction. He went to art school, although he didn't complete his course. He was a bit of a rebel, you know. He was more of an adventurer. He did all kinds of things in his life. But uh, I went to art school, and I think my love for art started Started back there. in our home. Great. And, and Ken, one of your initial teachers was Bjorn Vernerberg. Vernerberg. Because <laughs> um, he was a major influence because he was uh, in science and taxidermy also, yes. I believe, right? Yes. So that was He was a mentor. chief taxidermist in the local natural history museum. Very kind man and, and a brilliant taxidermist. He was famous all over Sweden, but he was also a sculptor. He studied in Italy and he carved Carrara marble sculptures. And there were some around in parts of, of the country. And, uh, and so he was very kind to me. And I studied with him, and, and uh, in because of his nature as well, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So and that would be the first of your, what you consider kind of formal mentor training. Yes, yeah, apart from my parents, of course, right. they all supported and encouraged it. But my dad was one to make a plain air painter, <laughs> and as a young kid, I was out to the, in the summer and in Sweden. The winter are dark and brooding, and that's why we are kind of dark. And broody. Yes, yeah. as you're exemplifying right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and the summers are the, it's light all the time, and my dad painted all the time outdoors. And he bring me with him, and I got pastels, and I got to paint, you know, and, and stuff. But, but um, so you were two D at first. At, at first, yes, yes. And mm -hmm. eventually came into sculpture. Yes, uh, through my mentor Bjorn Vandenberg, and then also the uh, the government. College of Art in Stockholm, in our capital. I went to art school there, mm -hmm. and I took drawing, painting, and sculpture, and then I specialized in sculpture. Yeah. And, and Ian, um, you had six years in, in an institute. Um, 
first three years were, you were there as a student, and the second three years when you went back, you were actually an instructor, making $12 a month? Uh, $12 a month. Close to that? Uh, less than that. Less than that, okay. <laughs> um, and his, Ian's training was pretty rigorous. The first year was uh, draw, drawing. Is, uh, drawing. Uh, you know, basically our uh, our education system is uh, is from uh, Soviet Union. Uh, when the two country, the two party, uh, have very close relationship, so we just borrow their uh, system. So uh, actually, my teacher, one of my teacher, uh, study five years course, finished the five years course in the Peterborough. Uh, the repping. The, uh, yeah, the repping uh, well, school. Meehan had three mentors. One was a woman who studied at the Chicago, in Chicago Art Institute, yeah. who yeah. Was, you're very close to. Yeah. Uh, then uh, a, a man who had studied at the Repin Institute, the East yeah. Asian. And then another man who was instrumental in me uh, learning the creativity after having the fundamentals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, they're, they're both, uh, they're all good teachers. Uh, they. You know, uh, they are teaching, uh, emphasize on the foundation. Uh, so what is the most important thing about art? Uh, but not limit yourself to one style. So they build your foundation, solid foundation for your future growing. So I, I still thank, thank them for all those. Uh, uh, even today, I still always remind myself uh, what is important. So uh, very, very helpful. I'm very thankful. For very it. thankful. Yeah. And, and Francois, in your in your later years, you um, you traveled. You were in Philippia to London and different places. You had a gallery at, at home in Johannesburg, mm -hmm. and you wanted to expand. So you went to Europe, and London didn't quite suit you because <laughs> of the uh, wasn't quite your atmosphere. You like yeah. No, I think we, um, you know. The story is really uh, when we started an art gallery, we lived in a town called George. Now I live in Georgetown, <laughs> Texas, which is quite an interesting coincidence. But um, we realized that, you know, um, an art gallery, uh, you know, to market your own work because we don't have the, the uh, amount of uh, outlets in in the form of art galleries in South Africa that you have in the States, you know. So um, I had dealt with some galleries, but in the, in, the, in, the, in the end, I thought, no, you know, I did my own shows uh, by arranging shows in different areas of the country, in small towns and so on. That's how I started when I started uh, professionally. And um, I ended up, uh, my wife, Celicia, and I decided to moved to this town near the coast where a lot of tourists came annually. And in the process, um, you know, we um, decided the gallery uh, would be a good idea. What happened as a result is we got tourists from all over the country and in, in the world. We had a lot of Americans coming through and people from England and other places in Europe. So um, that kind of triggered the idea we must expand our uh, market, you know, to, to um, maybe other parts of the world. So that's how we ended up going through England first, but of course England is not my scene, uh, <laughs> much to green, and uh, ended up going to the States, and that's, that's really where we started looking at a future for our work. And then Ken, you have been... <coughs> Netherlands, Africa, Germany, France. This guy's Mr. Bon Vivant. He's been all over the place with museums and seven years in Africa, Botswana, as a guide and hunter and everything else. So tell us a little bit about, in a nutshell, all those different areas and what you got from each of those. And we'll eventually get to you coming to the States. But I, this is fascinating, your travel. And be a big nut. Yeah, a big nut, yeah, yeah. OK. Um, <laughs> uh, what really happened, I went to art school in Stockholm. And at that time, it was abstract expressionism. 
after the initial training and all that stuff, we were supposed to do our own thing. We were not supposed to do real, let alone romantic animals and nature and stuff. And my professor, he was a very kind man, and he took me aside and he said, this is not the language of our time. You can never make a living just in realism. You're supposed to be abstract. And, and, uh, and he said, and I believed him, because I was a poor kid from a fishing village, so I took the museum line, and I became first a trainee uh, in, the, in the natural history museum in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. Then I went to Germany to get my diploma in the museum of civil science. And then I worked in a museum in Orléans, south of Paris. And for a bit studied in Holland too. And then thanks to all the contacts in Germany and everything, I had to learn German fluently because all my friends were in Germany. And through those contacts, I, I always dreamt of Africa, of course. And then I, um, I, I heard from German friends that knew somebody who was hiring, needed a taxidermist in Botswana. And so I wrote them in, in my broken English and they flew to London to interview me. And I hardly knew English at all, fluent in German. But for some reason, I don't know what they hired me. And uh, I got to Botswana, sent me a ticket. And then uh, quickly, uh, I was working with the foreign ministry, taking care of the skills in the field mm -hmm. and, and guiding the German clients. Because they, in those days, people didn't speak much English when they were from Germany. And then the Botswana's chief game warden, director of wildlife national park, a Scotsman, he was starting a national museum in Kabarone, the capital. And we became friends and they realized my museum background. So mm -hmm. I got hired to be curator for Botswana's national museum and start building the whole exhibit. I painted murals in the diorama and, and stopped in the end for the taxidermy. So do we go on to when we come to the US or what? Yeah. We're getting there. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know. You know but <coughs> it, the, De the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, they came in. I guess we are getting there. Denver. Yeah, but <laughs> who's your question? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Go. yeah. So, so Denver Museum, go ahead. And Nature and Science, they came on an expedition, and I was the guide in the field for many months. And uh, you sit in the campfires and talk, and the friends, and the president of the board was with them too. We'd drink at night and uh, around the campfire. <laughs> And it was uh, Alan Phipps, very wealthy man in Denver. And I said, thank you, they sent me a ticket to visit the US. I've never been in America. Ended up in Denver in the summer. Then took me up in the mountains, cowboy bars with sawdust on the floor, buffalo bills grave, bison herd. And you know, Europeans, you, most of you know, we are enamored with the West. In the fishing village, we play Indians and cowboys, throwing snowballs at each other. You know. And, and so, and then when I was ready to go back to Africa, they offered me the job to supervise the building of the, of the exhibit. Anyway, Great. I better quit. No, <laughs> perfect. A Ania, um, <coughs> you came to LA first for a year, yeah. right? And Ania has spent a lot of time in Canada, Toronto, Vancouver. He painted portrait or drew portraits in Stanley Park in Vancouver for four years. You should say that the street artist. Street artist, okay, yes. Ah. <laughs> um, and so tell us a little bit about coming to America for the first time and quite a bit of culture shock there uh, yeah, and, and the freedom yeah. that was that you were unaccustomed to. Yeah, well, uh, I, I am the kind of boy that didn't have a dream. I, I always say I didn't have a dream. I didn't even dream I end up in America when I was a boy. Of course, uh, well, uh, also I uh, heard a lot of story about uh, uh, people in America because in my hometown, uh, all those early immigrants to the United States to build the railroad to uh, for the gold rush, they most of them from my hometown. From the Golden Mountain? From, yeah, the Golden Mountain, yeah. They call United States Golden Mountain and not the world is flower black because your Black is so beautiful, he just, uh, just <laughs> so they call flower black, that means America. So uh, I heard a lot of story, but I didn't dream myself being one of uh, that in America. So, uh, but at the time after I uh, study and work in the college, uh, then the Cultural Revolution ended uh, when Mao died. And so everybody talking about, you know, have to 
explore, have to experience different things. The doors open for us, and so I get the chance. Everybody talking about uh, going, uh, leave the country. So we greet each other. So, oh, have you get get a visa? That's what we normally uh, when we meet each other. Oh, have you get a visa to United States? Have you get a visa? <laughs> That's the first <laughs> sentence we get. You know. So I get uh, yeah, I get to come to United States and stay one year, but I really want to stay uh, um, long. So I moved to Canada later. They say that easy to settle down. So I went to Canada, but the uh, difficult in the beginning is how to support yourself. Uh, mm. So I end up as a street artist in Stanley Park, uh, making portrait 25, $20 or $15 for uh, drawing. But what a great training. Uh, what what great, great training to be doing that every day. Oh yeah, yeah it's uh, you know, I, you know, I do more drawing than I did in my college. <laughs> 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 I can paint uh, 30, 20 portraits in one day. Yeah. Uh, wow. Compared to what I did in my college, I spent one week for one phase. Wow. Now uh, 20 or 30 phase in one day. Yeah, that's another word for freedom. <laughs> <laughs> that is a pr well, you have, you, when you have the freedom, it's hard to make choice. Uh, uh, that's true. That's <laughs> ironic. <laughs> yeah. It's very interesting. I was uh, discussing with uh, me and, uh, on the phone. I said, you know, what? You come from a communist China where everything is laid out for you. I said, and what was it like coming to the states? And he said, the hardest part of coming to the states was freedom. Yeah. Said, well, where do I go? Nobody's telling me what to do. <laughs> and so, I mean, it, it, it's kind of counterintuitive, but the fact that he had to deal with freedom. Uh, I thought it was fascinating. And the way that you did deal with it, I thought was fascinating. So, yeah. so it Compared to my daughter, you know, my daughter uh, born in Canada, uh, raised here as a Cajun. I think my life was more simple than her. She has so much choice, so many choices to make. <laughs> she has to depend on oh, well, what school I should apply, what uh, career should I take. It always <laughs> bothered her. It never bothered me when I was in China. Yeah. We just, you know, the government tell us, you do this. You have the chance to go to college, and you go to college. If right. you, they say you don't, so we don't. Yeah. <laughs> and Francois, um, you ended up coming <coughs> and spending, there was a lot of similarity between the landscapes in Tucson and Texas to your native, native land in, in South Africa. So there's kind of a, a, a natural bridge to the landscapes and work that you were doing. Yes, I think, uh, you know, South Africa has a variety of, uh, you know, from really sandy desert like and, and other areas which is similar to um, what we have experienced in Arizona. And of course, the, the bush areas where the most of the wildlife are uh, is very similar to parts of, of uh, Texas uh, where we live. Uh, uh, South Africa, in fact, has, you know, mountains with snow. People don't always realize it. Uh, the Drakensberg, which is uh, uh, very well known, and other parts of the country, there's, there's so much variety. But I concentrated mostly on the African, which is more well known here and around the world uh, for the wildlife, that kind of bush, the Kruger Park, which is uh, internationally known. That, that kind of landscape appeals to me. Mm -hmm. And eventually, um, later in, in later times, uh, I traveled further south from Johannesburg, where I lived, and Pretoria, uh, the capital, down to the coastal areas, and going through an area which is desert-like, uh, much like parts of uh, Ariz Arizona and uh, Texas even. And um, so, uh, you know, I, I prefer the drier seasons. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing that I concentrated on. But the, um, the whole approach uh, that I had was, you know, I, I experimented with different subjects. I didn't only paint landscape, but uh, in the end that I d uh, found that that was where the, my niche was and I, in my interest lies. And when we came to the States, ended up in Arizona, um, it, um, it felt quite easy to adjust to that. But, you know, as we traveled around the country and the West, you know, going further north into the uh, areas like Montana and Wyoming and so on, 
I saw a new world there, and especially the mountainous areas, which was a, a spectacular. But, uh, you know, you time, kind of pick your scene and what was familiar to you. Mm -hmm. But uh, the landscape, uh, to adjust to it, I think it's not that difficult. It's mainly, I think, the, the color, uh, you know, the different uh, desert seems to be more my scene. I'm not too into uh, bright colors, so that, that was something I had to adjust to. But the, uh, generally, you know, I think uh, the adjustment to come to the States was not that difficult, except, as I said, you know, my first thing was driving on the wrong side of the road. You know, that's how I look at it. You point that out pretty quick. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and then <coughs> the language wasn't that difficult. In South Africa, we had uh, grown up uh, speaking English and Afrikaans, which is my home tongue. But, um, you know, it, it wasn't that difficult to change there. It's, it's other cultural things. Now, one thing we all have in common <coughs> is a connection to artists of the West in America. Tucson 7 uh, seemed to be a group that kept coming up when mm. I was talking to these, these venerable gentlemen here. Uh, and, and what, what a formative, uh, how formative that was in their visions of painting the West and, and doing work in the West. Um, and so, Kent, if you want to start with your introduction to the art world here, and then we'll just go down the line here mm. and say how those personalities <coughs> and influences Yes, I always dreamt of being able to sculpt full time. I sculpted all the way on the side when I was a machine. So I sculpted all the African animals and stuff like that, and had a few bronzes as well and stuff. And I came here to Denver, to the West, and I met artists like George Carlson, my hero, and, and uh, Ned Jacobs, yep. Ken Bunn, and Hollis Wilford lived across the street from me. <laughs> yeah. and but George Carlson support were very supportive of me and he introduced me to now National Academy of Western Art. And uh, uh, I came to this show first time about 42 years ago and I saw these sculptures and it gave me the courage to jump off the bridge, the best paid museum job I ever had and live my dream. And of course, here at NAWA, National Academy, it was run by artists in those days. I got immediately drafted onto the committee. But I got to work with, the two, with those iconic people. The Lovells, the Climbers, the Bob Bettina Stankita in Egypt. Oh, what a great lady she was. <coughs> Thank you. I have a drawing on myself she did for me in Guinea. But to learn about the heritage of Mechmed and also realized that in the West, because America is so diverse, in the, in the West, it was the Western art movement was just getting underway in a big way. And here, representation of art mm -hmm. is back on stage. And in spite of what my professor said, <laughs> it was the language of our time. And I could make a living, well, not at first, it was a bit of a struggle, but, you know, do my dream, live my dream, you know. And that's, that's what, what the West, West did for me, and another thing I'm going to say quickly, <laughs> also the attitude for me as a European, and especially as Swede, people were so open and friendly. I loved it, to be in a grocery store, and a stranger would start <laughs> bloody talking to you. In Sweden, he would do that, or she would do that if she was drunk, but not a sober person in the middle of the day. There was such contact. I just, I just fell in love with the West in every way. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I remember as an art student, uh, I was at Scruffy and I was going to the Art Students League and I went into a, a laundromat. And of course, you know, California and New York are like two different countries. And I remember in the laundromat, there was this young lady and I was just waiting for my clothes to dry. And I remember striking up a conversation with her. And she was rather reticent at first and then we got into a great conversation. And after about 45 minutes later, she said, you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> so it was a similar <laughs> thing. And so me and you come over to the States and meeting some amazing people uh, <laughs> here in, your, in your career. Uh, Howard <laughs> Turpney, John Garrity helped you very much? And yeah, uh, well, uh, I didn't have uh, much to do with the West uh, until I was invited to by 
participate in the Mass of American West in Los Angeles. Uh, John Gallagher was the one who invited me, and then I meet uh, great artists like Howard Kirkman and a lot of, uh, they, a lot of them in this show. Uh, so uh, that is very inspirational. And, but I put myself in the Western scene like Indian cowboy, I don't see much, I think, in there. But the one subject I, I think I can appeal, I'm appeal to the Chinese uh, American, uh, the early uh, immigrants uh, to the United States. Uh, I told you that from my hometown, most of those uh, immigrants was from my hometown. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can speak their dialect uh, uh, directly. In Chinatown, when I came here, uh, nothing, not Mandarin, not Cantonese work, but my dialect of my hometown work in Chinatown. So uh, I am very familiar with all their story, their lifestyle, uh, their custom, their tradition. So that is the things I'm the most uh, familiar. Uh, so and the Chinese American was part of the American West. Absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. part of the history. So uh, that's why I do most of my subject uh, on the uh, Chinese American. You know, it's very interesting. When I, when I look at your paintings, I yeah. feel like, like you're living the life of each of those figures in that painting. I, I don't feel like it's just you know, covered mud and a stick with you know, hair on the end and you're just painting something on, on like you're really getting the lifeblood of each one of those figures. In fact, in the painting that we have in the show, there's a figure up in the upper, upper, yeah. upper corner. The yeah, yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's beautiful. Like, look, look, look at the, look at the, the corners of, of Neon's painting too. It's just every inch there's something happening, not overly busy, but extremely well thought out. And this beautiful figure up in the right that I only noticed after looking at everything else. So it's wonderful to see the care and attention and you know, the, the power and the poignancy that you put in your paintings. So I feel like you're living it. And that might be your blood memory mm. in, mm. in doing it. Sure, sure. That's part thank of Thank you for that gift. Yeah, I, I feel that's, part, thank you. I feel part of that is you. So, and I, you know, when I look at those old photographs, uh, they, uh, you know, the American keeps so a good record of the early Chinese immigrant. Mm -hmm. uh, they, we have a lot of old picture here. When I look at them, just remind me of my childhood when I was in China. The dress they wear in and uh, uh, the grocery store they open here look exactly like what was when I was a kid in China. <laughs> and they didn't change. So, uh, well, so I feel I'm part of the in the painting. And Francois, um, when you came to the States, um, you said I lived in Tucson, you lived in different places. Now you're in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, Stuart Johnson. Gallery scene was, was a big part of you. How did that all come about when you first came here? Well, you know, we traveled around uh, first. When we first came to the States, we came through London and ended up in uh, Rancid. And we actually planned to, to see some people in Canada because a lot of South African doctors went there and we thought maybe there's a market for South African artists in that part of the world. But we never ended up going there. Uh, you know, we just landed in Seattle. But in the process, um, we I knew another art, South African artist who lived in Tucson, uh, moved there years late uh, before me. And um, so we went down that direction and ended up um, not, not finding his address, but we knew about the, uh, the uh, Settlers West Gallery where Stuart Johnson was real, well known in, in the art world and we wanted to get there and that is how we started eventually because I managed after this the second visit only to find that gallery. We ended up turning around practically uh, you know less than a few hundred yards from the gallery because it was situated in a suburban you know in, uh, between homes and so on. We didn't realize that we turned back too soon. But in any case, um, that's when we started. And in the process, you know, that you mentioned that the Tucson Seven, that we met all these artists, amongst them, of course, Howard Pearson, and the uh, 
the main, uh, the one most well known. But uh, we ended up being friends with him, and that that is when we settled to get into the country. And uh, I think it really was the start of a new life here. It, the adjustment was actually quite easy in the end because uh, in South Africa you had a bilingual, uh, you know, language, which both English and Afrikaans, which I'm Afrikaans, but uh, English wasn't a big problem. It's just adjusting to the American way of thinking was a bit of a challenge, but that that uh, we found is, uh, you know, not. Uh, something difficult to overcome. And we really found uh, Tucson a, a nice place to live. We loved the, the area, and uh, you know, but uh, as you travel around the country, you realize there's a lot more to see. <laughs> and uh, of course, we say we, we started in the west, but we ended up getting uh, most of our travels towards this side of the country, and Texas became our draw card. My wife got the itch and said she wants to go to check out uh, Texas. Texas has a, a feel to it. And Chris Rowe, we are glad you did it. Oh, we are glad <laughs> you're here, I promise you. I would like to do something <coughs> a little unorthodox, and as I call these names, please remain standing. Verla Spielberg, Gloria Situ, Cecilia Karsh, and Maureen Dutra. <laughs> we, we all have this in common. Our women, our spouses are absolutely essential to our success. So we congratulate you and recognize you. <laughs> okay, we have 39 seconds. Does anyone have a question? <laughs> are there any questions? Okay. Randy, can I say a few words? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. I just wanted to express my gratitude for me to come to America. And I'm living my dream here, and I'm so grateful. My wife and I are American citizens, proud Americans. Mm -hmm. And here in America, I can live my dream. I told my kids to kiss the ground in the morning. I'm probably the most grateful American you've ever met. Thank you. Well, I, I think I can uh, add to that. And I, I really feel that being an American citizen, we've now been here for roughly 18 years, uh, was a fantastic feeling to be part of the country, not only as a foreigner, but as a citizen now. And although we have family in South Africa, and we sometimes uh, long for them, we really, we have our one son here now, and it makes it easier. And I want to make one point. My wife, uh, Celicia, is, uh, you know, I, I could say, they say that it takes two to tumble, you know. And I, 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 my <laughs> wife uh, really is, is such a part of what I do. Uh, I could not have got here and done without her, and I really want to thank her for uh, her encouragement and help. I think it's something that uh, most artists would agree. You know, an artist can't survive on its own. We, mo you know, <laughs> we need our wives or we need our partners. Yep. And uh, this is really uh, uh, part of what we say. It's uh, the way life works. You've got to be a, a team. I agree. Me and yeah. you, well, uh, they are, uh, say, uh, say, well, uh, you can always say the American, of course. Give me a new life and thank my wife for uh, my happy life now. I especially like to thank uh, Randy all today uh, because I told him that uh, my English is so lazy. And uh, that's one of my difficulties in America. You did great. <laughs> you know what? When sometimes if you make a joke or I am the only one sitting there, I don't know. Everybody <laughs> <laughs> laughing. I'm the one sitting there, I don't know what it means. So <laughs> you make the question simple. So I understand. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Uh, I'll, I'll just close up. Oh, okay.
very quickly, um, um, because these guys just were great. In fact, I'm going to say a quick thing about Francois. He was asked to do this by Susan, and he, he said, let me think about it. So I'm glad you called back the next day and went against your better judgment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for your excellent help here this afternoon. Oh, you kidding? Yeah, <laughs> I think you did a wonderful <laughs> job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Join me in thanking our panel for their wonderful expertise and for being here. And now we invite our premium package purchasers, society members, and sponsors to please stay and enjoy lunch here in the SEC. For all of the guests, the Museum Grill is located outside the SEC doors and offers a variety of fresh salads, sandwiches, and wraps for you to enjoy. The museum store trunk shows are open at this time, located at the main entrance of the museum store, and will remain open until 4 o'clock today. I'm pleased to also share with you that we will have the opportunity to meet some of the Prita West artists for a book signing in the, right here in the SEC beginning today at noon. Enjoy your lunch. We'll see you back here at 1 o'clock for the afternoon seminar. Thanks. <laughs>